Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege we have once again to be gathered together before you and by the Spirit of God to learn at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege you give us every week as we come like this. We know these are days we need to be hearing from you every time. And we are praying, O oh Lord, that your word to us today will challenge us, will stir us up, will lead us to purposeful action in your word, in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your spirit will take these words and apply to every detail of every life here tonight, in Jesus' name. And we are praying that as a result of hearing your word, will act on the word, respond to the word, believe you, obey you, and do the things you want us to do, so that the blessings of obedience will be upon every one of us, in Jesus' name. We pray that the carelessness we see in the lives of other people, the lukewarmness we see in the lives of other people, the forgetfulness we see in the lives of other people, will not be in our lives, in Jesus' name. Speak to us as your children. And we pray that as dear children, we too will respond spontaneously, promptly to your word in Jesus' name. Open our eyes tonight, O Lord, that we may see and behold wonderful or wondrous things out of your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome you to our Bible study once again in Jesus' name. For those who have been coming for a long time, I must appreciate the fact that you take the word of God seriously and you realize that the word is a backbone to the life of the Christian. No wonder you are coming dutifully, regularly, every time wanting to learn from the word of God. For workers who are here, I need to remind you, it's wonderful that you are here. Understand, this is the word that will equip you, that will transform you. That is actually the mode and the method of your training so that you can be all that God wants to, you to be in the service of the Lord. To the newcomers, to the new converts, to the believers who are here, understand, it is the backbone of the believer. It is the backbone of the church. That is why every believer and this whole, this whole church takes the Bible study very seriously. At the present time, we're in the study of the epistle to the Hebrews. And it's a very rich and deep epistle. In fact, I've told you in the past studies that uh, you'll find in this epistle the word better. And this is the word that runs through the whole epistle. We have a Christ better than men, better, better than angels, better than priests, and better than high priests, and better than prophets. We have Jesus Christ better than the uh, age angels who are the mediators of the old covenant. We also have the mention of heavenly things, heavenly tabernacle, heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly throne. Everything in this epistle is leading you to something away from the earth and leading you to the heavenly. We have already gone through four studies in the epistle to the Hebrews. We we'll study chapter 1. And we have gone through chapter 1 to tell us of the exalted position or the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we begin the study of chapter 2. Today we are going to have chapter 2 verses 1 through to 4. Open your Bible with me. Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more honesty to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness. Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles. And the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. You will find that these four verses are all together. In fact, the four verses are connected with chapter 1. Because it says in chapter 2 verse 1, Therefore. 
When you see therefore in the Bible, anytime, anywhere, it means you are connected with what had been previously said. The word therefore, which begins this chapter 2, is referring to the previous chapter. The exhortation in our present study today is given on the basis of what had been stated in chapter 1 concerning the person and the preeminence of Christ. It's telling us, because of who Christ is, because God is now speaking by His only begotten Son, because He's the uh, brightness of His glory, is the express image of His person, because He's upholding all things by the word of His power, because He had by Himself purged our sins, and because He's sitting down on the right hand of majesty, therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things we're hearing. It's telling us the prophet spoke in the Old Testament, and God confirmed their word. But now God is speaking to us by a son whom he has appointed to be heir of all things. And because Christ is greater than all those prophets, therefore, because of that reason, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. It goes beyond that. In verse 4, chapter 1, it says, Being made so much better than the angels. It's telling us this, Therefore, because Christ, the Son of God, because Christ, because of His exalted position, because of His exalted title, because of His exalted nature, because of His exaltation and pre-existence and eternal existence, it says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. In fact, it says in verse 2, that is chapter 2, verse 2, For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? You understand now? It's saying because Christ is greater than the angels in a sevenfold manner. Because we dealt with that uh, last week. Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. The angels are servants. He is the very Son of God. The angels were created. But He is the eternally existent one. Is the one that had been before the beginning. And the angels were actually to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. When he brought the first begotten into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. Because the angels were made spirits and a flame of fire. That is a flaming fire. And yet Jesus Christ is not a, is not a servant, is not a creature. is the one that the Father addresses, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Because Christ has an eternal kingdom. Because Christ is going to be the final judge. And because Christ is righteous, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And because Christ continues forever and ever, the earth will be folded up. But thy years shall not fail, thou art the same, thy years will remain. And because the angels are only servants, but then Christ is the one of all authority, who is to sit on the right hand of the majesty on high, until he makes, until God makes, all his enemies is put to because of that. Because of that, because of the exaltation of Christ, therefore, Christ who is now speaking, we need to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip away from us. Then he said in the latter part of verse 3, that the word that Jesus spoke, they were confirmed unto us by them that heard him. You know, Paul the apostle is the one that wrote this epistle. But he didn't see the Lord face to face. And therefore he was saying that the word was confirmed unto us by the eyewitnesses that had him directly. And then he said it was not only human confirmation or affirmation. He said in verse 4, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles. That is, the word of Christ was confirmed by the Lord. Did he open the eyes of the blind? It was a confirmation of his claim, his credential, that is the Messiah. Did he make the lame to walk? 
Did he cast out devils? Did he raise the dead? Did he walk on the sea? Did he multiply bread? It was the miracle that confirmed the credentials and the claim of Christ as the Son of God. God also confirming, bearing witness, both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Then he tells us that even when those apostles, when they preached the word, God also confirmed. He's saying on the basis of that kind of confirmation, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard. Let me tell you something here. Here is the method of an effective teacher. Here Paul the Apostle, the writer, obviously a teacher and a preacher of great effectiveness. He did what every effective teacher must do. An effective teacher must do what the writer has done here. After presenting biblical facts, he must warn. He must exhort. He must encourage his hearers to obedience. It is not enough to preach and teach sound doctrine. The preacher or the teacher must move the hearers to respond and act on the word. It's not enough that you preach salvation. You must lead the hearers to get saved. You must tell them, here is the appointed time. You cannot procrastinate. You cannot wait till tomorrow. Today is the accepted time. You move them and lead them and drive them on their knees to repent and be saved even now. We must give them more earnest heed. The word of God demands response. If you preach on sanctification and holiness, that's not enough. You must lead the people to desire, to consecrate, and to pray until they receive that experience of sanctification and holiness. That's what a faithful teacher of the word of God must do. And whatever we teach in the word of God, we must make sure that we are driving the people leading the people, compelling the people that they must respond immediately to the word of God and they must get the experience of the Lord. As the writer of the Hebrews of the epistle to the Hebrews convincingly presents the superiority of Christ to the angels. It then gives a moving invitation to receive and keep salvation from Christ. As all good invitations, it both includes exhortation and warning. That is, it tells you, exhortation, what to do. It gives you warning. What will happen if you do not do what you need to do? We can know all the truth there is to know about Jesus Christ, and yet go to hell if we do not receive Him as Savior and experience transforming life through Him. So we are going to look at these four verses, important verses indeed, under three subtitles. Number one, exhortation to right response. Exhortation to right response. That you'll find in verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. That's exhortation. Number two, danger of neglect. Verses 2 and 3. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? The danger of neglect. Number three, the confirmation of God's word. The middle part of verse three, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing witness. Both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles. And the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. Not according to our will. According to his will. Not according to the will of men or demons. According to his will. You know Herod wanted to see Jesus Christ perform a miracle. According to his own will, he called him to show him signs and wonders. But no, it doesn't happen according to the will of doubters, according to his will. The father confirmed the word of the son, the word of Jesus Christ, as his only begotten son, to give approval, to give the indication that this is that son in whom my soul is well pleased, and to give the confirmation that you should hear him. He confirmed his word. 
Number one, the exhortation. Number two, the danger of neglect. Number three, the confirmation. Let's go back to number one. Exhortation to the right response. And um, I cannot stress this uh, enough because this is very, very important. In fact, this is the very end of teaching, the purpose of teaching, the climax of teaching, the reason for teaching. We're not here at the Bible study just to show what deep knowledge you can have of the Bible. We're not here in the worship, in the service, just to show how we can analyze the Bible, teach the Bible, instruct from the Bible, extract great things out of the Bible. This is the very goal. This is the very aim. And this is the very climax of teaching. Exhortation to the right response. Listen, when we teach about repentance, we're exhorting you, you need to respond. We teach about restitution. The climax of that teaching is your response. And we teach about salvation by grace and uh, justification by faith. The uh, climax of it is your response. We're talking about holiness. We're talking about sanctification. The uh, climax of it is your response. Are we teaching on the Holy Ghost baptism? The climax of it is your response. Here we now see exhortation to response. Look at verse 1. Therefore... We ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Please, bear with me. This verse is so loaded with meaning that we should not just keep the verse and feel that we have read it, we understand it. Let us look at it. Therefore, we. What does that mean? We, the apostles who have been preaching to you. We, the evangelists and the prophets, and we, the uh, pastors and the teachers, we should give the more honesty to the things which we have heard. Have we heard from the Lord? Have we heard the word of God? Has He spoken to us directly? As the Spirit be bringing to our remembrance the word of the Lord, then we preachers must give the more honesty to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. We who are workers... We who have heard the word of God. Paul was telling Timothy, he said, Know from whom you have learned what you have learned. Then he, he told Timothy, Commit these same words to faithful hearers, and who shall be able to teach others also. Those are workers. Are you a worker? Then it's saying, Therefore we workers, who have heard the word of God, who are learning from week to week, the things we are teaching, teaching the house fellowship, teaching the zone, teaching the district, we who are workers to you ought to give the more honest deed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. In fact, he's also talking to the members of the church. He says, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, even as I have overcome, and I am seated with my father on the throne. Are you a member of the church? Are you a citizen of the kingdom? Are you a new convert? Have you given your life to the Lord? We ought to give the more honesty to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. It's more than that. There are people... <coughs> who have been hearing the word of God, they have not been saved, they have not given their lives to the Lord, they have the intelligence, they have the understanding, they know that Christ died on the cross of Calvary, they know that he died for our sins, but they have not got to that point, they have not made a decision, they have not committed their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and this word is coming to you directly, it says, huh, if you waste time, if you do not give, Repent. Danger is ahead of you. Therefore, because in this last time, the, the last voice of the Father that will ever come to you is coming through the Son. Therefore, we, the people who have been hearing but have not been saved, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Important word indeed. Now, when it says... Let's start any time. What does it mean? What are the times we have the danger or the possibility of letting the world slip away from us? Well, we can say this, it may be at a time of suffering. You will know that the children of Israel, it was at a time of their suffering. 
At the time when they felt there was no water to drink, that they forgot the word of God, and then they were thinking they had forgotten the exhortation they heard. They had forgotten what they heard from, uh, from Sinai. They had forgotten the word which had been given unto them. They were even thinking of going back into Egypt. At the time of suffering, there is the danger, there is the likelihood, there is a tendency to forget the things we have heard. It may be at the time of poverty, nothing to eat, no money to take care of ourselves, no money to take care of our families. It may be at that time we stand in the danger of letting it sleep, of letting it go by us. It may be at the time of sickness, you will remember Job's sickness. You will remember that the wife, at the time when that sickness struck the family, struck the head of the family, that that wife said, cause God and die. It's at that time we have the danger of letting the word slip away from us. It may be at the time of oppression, at the time of persecution. There are some people that give up. They just yield up. They, they, they can't continue with the Lord at the time of oppression and persecution. That's why it says we ought to give the more honesty. Lest at any time, in the time of suffering, of poverty, of sickness, of oppression, of persecution, lest at that time we let the word slip away from us. But it's not only that, at a time of joy, when everything is going on fine, when you've got everything you think you need to get, you have, you have become wealthy at the time of wealth, at the time of progress. You remember Hezekiah. Hezekiah had been a good king. He had been seeking the Lord. Then he became sick. And he still remembered the Lord. Isaiah came to him, set your house in order, because you will die. And this man continued to pray. He did not let the word of promise, the, Lord of, the word of power, he did not let it sleep. Then God said, Isaiah, go back to him. I've given him 15 years added to his life. Then he became well. And at a time of joy, at a time of progress, at a time of prosperity, at a time of health, what did he do? He allowed the word of warning to sleep. And then eventually these people came from the eastern part. And then they, they saw him and he showed them all the things that they got. And the prophet came to him and said, What have they seen in your house? He said, There's nothing I have which they have not seen. And then the prophet said, The time is coming. When nothing will be left, those people will come from Babylon. They will take all your sons and all your daughters away. And they will take your property away. Your sons will become eunuchs in Babylon. You see, it was at a time of joy and wealth and health and prosperity and progress that he let the world sleep. What a warning we are receiving, brothers and sisters, that we ought to jealously guard, we ought to jealously keep and protect the things that we have got. Therefore, we ought uh, to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Bear with me. Let me give you some understanding of those words, lest we should let them sleep. The, the words in the original Greek actually related to a sheep uh, that had been uh, wanting to get into harbor. Just at the time of wanting to get to harbor, there is neglect and there is uh, oversight. And then the sheep passed the harbor. And the language is letting it sleep uh, from the anchorage. Therefore, the billows and the waves and the storm just uh, take the sheep away and is not able to stay at, uh, the, at the harbor, at the shore. It's saying that our lives may be driven like that. And our lives may just pass the harbor, may just uh, bypass the promised land. And we may not be able to anchor our soul on the Lord Jesus Christ and eventually make heaven. Because we allow the world to slip by just carelessly and driven by circumstances because of suffering, because of poverty, because of sickness, because of oppression, because of persecution, because of joy, because of wealth, because of prosperity, because of health, because of progress. And then we allow the world to slip away from us. We ought to be very, very careful. Keep to the word. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. And in verse 25. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. 
For if they escaped not to refuse him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is still talking about a comparison. It's talking about those that spoke on earth. It's talking about him that speaketh from heaven. Who are the people that spoke from earth? Those are the prophets. Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Ezekiel. The prophets, they spoke on earth. God spoke through them. But the people that neglected their word, they escaped not. Who refused him? Who refused the prophets that spoke on earth? And it says much more. Much more. For us who are living in the new dispensation. In this time of grace. In this new covenant age. Much more shall we not escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. The voice of the Lord is not coming up to us from heaven. The Son of God is not speaking to us from heaven. The Father is speaking through the Son unto the church today. And we shall not escape much more if we, if we neglect, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth. He said at that time the voice of God at Sinai shook the earth. But now he has promised saying yet once more. I shake not the earth only but heaven also. It's telling us that we are living in a more delicate time. In a more serious time. That we ought to give the more honest heed to the things that we have heard. It's telling us not to be careless with the word. To jealously guard the word, to jealously take care of the word, to jealously obey the word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Keep thy soul, not carelessly, not uh, casually, not uh, normally, um, not, uh, you know, just uh, do it uh, the normal way, diligently. Be diligent about it, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thine heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. It's still telling us to hold on, to grieve very firmly and very seriously the word which we have heard. Don't let it sleep. Don't let it sleep. Don't let it go by you. Sometimes you know the word can go by you just like that, as if it slips through your fingers. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 46, and he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day. Uh, would you notice those words? Set your hearts. Set your hearts. Fix your heart. Be stable about it. Be steadfast about it. Don't allow distraction. Set your hearts upon the word which I testify among you this day. Which ye shall command your children to observe to do. And all the words of this law. All the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you. Because it is your life. Your very life. And through this sin, ye shall prolong your days in the land, whither ye shall go over Jordan to possess it. The word is your very life. In fact, it is a sin that will keep your soul. When it says it is your life, uh, Proverbs explains it uh, very clearly. Look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 20 to verse 22. My son, attend to my word. No distraction, attend to my word. No carelessness, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. It's your very life. Keep it. Hold it. Be steadfast about it. Diligently keep the word of God. You can see, as I've told you, the word therefore at the beginning of the chapter connects us to what had been said before. If Christ is the supreme one, 
who is set forth in the first chapter, then we ought to give the more earnest heed to his word. If Christ occupies the preeminence in God's universe, as the writer has set forth in chapter 1, then we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we are hearing from him. If Christ is the one that has all authority, all power, then we ought to give this message the importance and the preeminence that is equal to his personality. That's what it's saying. It's saying that the Messiah and his message are inseparable. Christ's message is inseparably interwoven with his person. That means we cannot think of his message without thinking of his eternal pre-existence. We cannot think of his message without thinking of his in incarnation, without thinking of his supernatural birth, without thinking of his perfect sinless life. You know, as you think of his incarnation, God in flesh, God becoming flesh, as you think of his supernatural birth, you think of his perfect sinless holy life, then you think of his message. That puts his message above any other message you may hear from any man or we have heard from any other man. You think of his supernatural, miraculous acts and deeds. You think of his resurrection and ascension. You think of his eternal exaltation. Then you think of the importance of his message. If Christ is as important as he is, if Christ is exalted as he was exalted, if, if Christ is greater than even all the angels, and the angels are worshipping him, then we ought to know the importance and the pre-existence and the preeminence of his message. You cannot reject any portion of his message without rejecting him and facing the eternal consequence. Before anybody says, well, I believe the word of God. It's only restitution. I don't believe. Check up before you say that. Because that's a part of the message of Christ. And you cannot reject a part of the message of Christ without rejecting Christ. Christ and his message are inseparably interwoven. Before anybody says, well, I, I love the word of God and I appreciate everything. The only thing I don't like is uh, uh, when they say, and they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And they say we should not have anything to do with the customs and the ceremonies of the world. Before you go far, uh, think of who said that. Think of who said that. Rejecting his word is rejecting him. Rejecting him is rejecting God. Before you say, well, uh, I don't agree with this word of sanctification. You must remember who said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. Because as you reject his word, you reject any part of his message, you are rejecting him. Jesus is the voice of God. God is not speaking to us through his son. Jesus was God in the world. To reject him is to reject God. And to reject God is to reject the mercy of God and everlasting fellowship with him in eternity. You see, that is why we ought to be very, very careful that we do not allow anything to hinder us from believing the totality, the completeness of the word of God. That's why the preacher is reminding us all the time we need to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. In Second Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Now, do you notice something here, brothers and sisters? This is to correct uh, the error, the mistake, or the negligence of some of us. If we look at the outline and it says, well, today we're, we're talking about the new birth. We're talking about salvation. We're talking about keeping safe. Oh, we we'll say, do I need to know that? I know that already. Look at what the apostle is saying. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. To put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them. Though ye know them. You know, there are people that will tell us, I already know that. In fact, that's the place I studied in my quiet time. I've even taught people that. I've explained it to other people. That's the excuse for missing out the Bible study. 
if you challenge a dear brother, a dear sister that you appreciate, that you love, and you say, brother, what's happening? You were not at the Monday Bible study. Oh, he says, yes, I wasn't there. Anything new? Anything they have taught there that I don't know already? What did they speak about? Jesus is greater than angels. You need to tell me that. Don't I know that? Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Joshua. You need to tell me that. I don't know that. Jesus is greater than all the prophets. Do you need to tell me that? That Jesus was not created, but he created all things. Why waste my time and come to the Bible study? I know that already. Brothers, let's be careful of spiritual pride. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them. And it even says, though you be established in the present truth. Although you are established in them, you know them, you have even taught other people, I will still put you in remembrance. We need it. Verse 13, Yea, I think it meet, I think it necessary, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. It's not that we are teaching any new thing. It's not that you didn't know it before. We need to remind ourselves. Then look at verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my departure, after my disease, to have these things always in remembrance. That's why we're emphasizing them. And we shouldn't neglect any of these things. The exhortation. Which exhortation? Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed to the things which we have heard, lest any time, at any time, we should let them sleep. That exhortation is directed at all of us who have heard God's word, Christian workers, church members, as well as all believers who are still faithfully holding on to what they have heard must give the more honest heed to the word of God. Remember the word of God, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let's now go to point number two. In Hebrews chapter 2, Verses 2 and the first part of verse 3. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Let me tell you the uh, way that verse is connected with verse 1. It's telling us well to give the more honesty. And then he reminds us, he said, look at the past. Remind yourself of history. Because history often repeats itself. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, like the word spoken by angels to lodge in Sodom and Gomorrah, that Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. The word spoken by angel to the mother of something, that he'll have a child. He described the birth of the child and the nature of the child. The word spoken by the angel was steadfast. And he said, he told them what the child will eat, what the child will not eat. He'll be a Nazarite unto the Lord. The word was steadfast. And then, if you remember when angel Gabriel came to um, Zechariah, the son of uh, John the Baptist, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. Now, it says, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Every transgression, that word transgression here is uh, a deliberate crossing of the line. To trespass into the forbidden land area. Trespass. Every transgression. That is every time somebody overstepped its boundary. Every time somebody deliberately, actively committed something contrary to what the Lord had said they should not do. That it received a just recompense of reward. I need to remind you of uh, the what happened to Lot's wife. The angels had said, uh, Do not look behind you. Escape to the mountain. 
And then she looked back, she became a pillar of salt. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Do you remember that uh, that uh, young man, Samson, he had been told, Rizal will not come upon his head. The angel had emphasized that. Eventually, Rizal came upon his head. He lost uh, the air. He lost the power. And then he was tormented and tortured by the Philistines. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. You remember Zechariah uh, when he doubted the word of the angel. And then the angel said, because you have not believed my word, I am the angel and in the presence of the Almighty God. You will become dumb for nine months, you will not be able to speak a word. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. Now it goes into verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? He's saying, you know, the Lord Christ is greater than the angels. If the people that transgressed, that disobeyed, the words of the angels were punished severely, how much more the people that neglect or reject the word of the Lord Jesus Christ? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That's the word we are being told here. It's telling us of the danger of neglect. Remember the comparison, Christ is greater than the angels. Those who uh, contradicted or transgressed, the word of the angels were punished and punished severely. Then they sins Christ is greater. Those who reject, those who transgress, the word of Christ will be punished severely. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How of how much sorrow punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has not despised unto the Spirit of grace. You know what he's saying here? He's saying that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they despised the word of Moses. They died without mercy. And you find in the Old Testament, the people that transgressed the word of Moses or any other prophet of the Lord of the Old Covenant, they died without mercy. Now he's telling us that the God of the New Testament is not an indulgent God. You know there are people that say, well, we're now in the New Testament. It's a new dispensation. It's the age of grace. And because it is the time of grace, God will not punish sin anymore. You may even abuse him and insult him and disobey him and disregard him and spit on his face. They tell us you are saved and forever saved. They say now it is the age of grace and the age of a mercy and God will not do anything against anybody now. Just get saved and you are saved forever. The Bible says no. He that despised the law of Moses died without mercy. Under two or three witnesses of how much sorrow, greater, more terrible punishment. Suppose he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God. Now, how do you tread on the Son of God? Because you cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ not physically to stamp on him, to walk on him, to walk over him. When you trample on the Word of God, you are trampling on the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. You trample on the Word of God, you are trampling on the Son of God. You reject the Word of God, you are rejecting Christ. You belittle the Word of God, you are belittling Christ. And you make of none effect the word of God. You are making of none effect the very Son of God. You are trampling, you are treading under the Son of God. And has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith it was sanctified an unholy thing. You were saved before. You were sanctified before. You were pardoned before. You were purged before. You were saved and sanctified. You were cleansed and purged. You were saved and you were perfected by the blood of Christ. But now you count that blood as unnecessary. 
of no consequence. You have nothing to do with that blood. You disregard that blood of Jesus. You belittle the efficacy and the power in that blood of Jesus Christ. It says your punishment will be great. It will be as great as the punishment of Judas Iscariot. Then it says, and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. What does that mean? You see, there are, when you become born again, you have the Spirit of God in a measure in you. You are bearing witness with your heart to a child of God. Then you have you are sanctified. That Spirit of God is more active in your life. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost. It becomes a comforter speaking within all the time. And then you begin to get into the area of uh, the forbidden area, the no-go area, the thing that a child of God will not do, should not do. And then the Spirit of God begins to say, no, 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 you cannot do that, you must not do that. And then you begin to harden your heart. You begin to rebel against the Spirit. Then you start by grieving the Spirit of God. Then eventually you get into sin. And uh, the Spirit of God leaves you. It cannot remain where you are deliberately offending the Lord, abandoning the way of the Lord, and you are disregarding the word of God. And after He has left you from the outside, it's knocking at the door. It's no more inside, but it's outside. It's knocking at the door. It's saying, you can still be saved. You can still come to the Lord. And then you harden your heart, you stiffen your neck, you say, no, I don't want that. that. You even say, that's the devil telling you to repent. You say, that's the devil troubling your life. You say, that's the devil that is wanting you to give your life fully to the Lord again. Want you to consecrate again. You see, a new way, a permissive way, a way, a way, a place where no holiness is necessary. You are doing despite unto the spirit of grace. Your punishment will be incalculable. Your punishment will be indescribable, unbearable. So that's the warning we're given here. It's talking of the danger of neglect. Now, there are other people too who have neglected in the past. They neglected the fact that they ought to keep their spiritual lives. You see, our spiritual lives are very delicate. And you keep that life by prayer, by watching, by reading the word of God. By regular quiet time, by prompt obedience to the Lord, you are always keeping the, the grace of God in your life. By resisting temptation, by responding immediately, the Spirit of God is saying, Why are you doing that? Oh Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't know I shouldn't have done that. It's a moment of carelessness. You are washed in the blood of the Lamb immediately. You do not sleep over disobedience and rebellion and stiff neck and say it doesn't matter because if you neglect your spiritual life, it's very, very dangerous. Now look at First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual food, the same spiritual meat. It's talking about the children of Israel. They ate the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Were they not saved? They were saved. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Were they not delivered? They were delivered. They were delivered out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt. Were they not blessed? They were blessed. They ate manna every day. Was the supernatural not made available to them? Of course, they drank water out of their all. Did God not show himself to be mighty over them? Of course, they passed through the Red Sea. Were they not the children of God? Of course they were. Let my son go and worship me on the mountain. They were the people of God. They were the redeemed of the Lord. They sang the song in Exodus chapter 14, this in chapter 15, and they said, He redeemed us. And they praised the Lord, their Redeemer. They were saved. But look at this in verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Overthrown in the wilderness. They didn't get to the land of promise. Now it says, is that just history for history's sake? No, it is reaching for a purpose. What's the purpose? 
to warn us of the danger of neglect, the danger of carelessness, the danger of backsliding. Now these things were our examples to the intent, for the purpose, that we should not lose utter evil things as they also lost it. Neither be ye idolaters as some of them were, as some of them, and as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. You see the lives of the people that are telling us, once you get out of Egypt, everyone that comes out of Egypt will land on a promised land. No. They tell us everyone that is saved will eventually get to heaven. Whether they backslide, whether they insult God, abuse God, disobey God, spit on the face of the Lord. No. That's why it says we must be very careful. We do not neglect what we have got, abandon what we have got. Then it says in verse 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. It gives us the lesson in verse 11. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standard take heed, lest he fall. If there were no danger, why do we have verse 12? If the one that has, the people that are saved, if they are forever saved and they can never fall, why do we have verse 12? Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standard take heed, lest he fall. If we can go on living our lives carelessly, join another church, go to another ministry, uh, paint ourselves and have the jewelry, get into worldliness, begin to steal again, begin to get into fraud, we are saved and forever saved, there is no danger. Why do we have verse 12? If we can, after we are born again, go and marry a believer and go and do ceremonial things in the world and do everything the people of the world are doing, there is no danger. We are saved and forever saved. We can never fall. And once we are secured in the Lord, we have eternal security. What do we have verse 12? Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standeth take heed, lest he fall. Look at you. This is very important. I don't know whether you have ever seen this. Very, very important scripture. Jude verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though ye once knew this. It's saying maybe you knew this before. In fact, I'm sure you knew this before. I will put you in remembrance. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. It tells us that those eternal security preachers are liars. They are deceiving people. If you have believed the Lord, keep that spiritual life. Because if you don't keep that spiritual life, if you go back into sin, you will be lost and judged and doomed and damned. Because, you know, after God had saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards, after that salvation, after that redemption, after that deliverance, afterward, he destroyed them that did not continue to believe. That's the secret. You continue to believe. He destroyed the people that did not continue to believe. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering in into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 11, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. After the same example of unbelief. Come back to uh, chapter 2 of Hebrews and now in verse uh, 3. It says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, uh, the people who preach eternal security, oh, they say, this is not talking to the believer. They say, you can never neglect what you have got already. They say, he's talking to the people that have not got salvation. 
here is the way they put it. They say, there are people who have been coming to church for many, many years. They have been hearing the word of salvation. They have been hearing about Christ. They have been hearing about justification. They have been hearing about heaven. But they have not really been saved. And then they say, the apostle here is warning them that this is not a warning to the believer. They are saying that, he is saying, how shall we, who have had the word of salvation but have not been saved, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, the salvation we have not got? That's not the word the word of God is saying. If you have got something, you can neglect it. Those eternal security preachers are telling us we cannot neglect whatever we have got already. What does the Bible say? If we have got something, can we neglect it? Oh yes, we can neglect. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Here Paul was telling Timothy, he said, you have got the gift. The gift is in thee. The gift was given to thee. It was received by prophecy. In fact, to receive it by the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, presbyteros in uh, Greek, meaning the elders. And it says you have got it. And yet it says, be careful, you don't neglect it. Oh, you see there, we can neglect what we have got already. We have experience of that in life. You find um, a person that has, he has good hands, he has uh, a good legs, and he, didn't, uh, and he has a good brain too, too. But then he neglects to teach his brain, to instruct his brain, to train his brain, to make his son to know how to write. That neglect can make that person to remain an illiterate. He has a good hand, he has a good brain, but because he has neglected to train that hand, he has neglected the gift of the brain and of the good hand, then he does not know how to write or how to read. Not only that, you know, sometimes uh, if you have been, you know, running as an athlete, you can run without getting tired. Then you do not do your exercises anymore, the trotting and the jogging and the jumping. You don't do that anymore, and you don't do that for many, many years. You can lose the ability to run the race that you have been running before. Although you still have the legs, you have neglected the exercises. You lose the adequate use of the legs. Not only that, you know, sometimes somebody has a parcel of land. And uh, you bought it, and not only that, you have even paid the money, you have uh, got all the documents and all the papers. Then you say, I've got it, I've got it. You don't build anything on it. You don't set anybody to watch it uh, for you. And if the thing is just there, and then people come to you and say, Ah, you better be careful. How shall we escape the loss of that land if we neglect to put uh, somebody there to be watching over it? If we neglect to build something there, we can lose that thing. Or it is that uh, here it is, here you are, you have got some treasure in a box, and you put that box in the room. And then you will not lock uh, the room, you will not even lock the box. Somebody comes to you and he says, don't you know there are thieves around? How are you acting carelessly like this? How shall we escape the loss of this thing to the thieves if we neglect to watch over what we have got? I just gave you those illustrations to tell you that if we neglect, we can lose what we have got. Of course, if sinners neglect, they will not be saved. There is great peril, there is great danger. If sinners neglect, so great salvation. But then also the believers are in great danger. If we neglect to give diligence to make our calling and election sure. And our loss will be incalculable. Our loss will be unbearable. If we neglect the message of full salvation, of so great salvation, preached by Christ and by the eyewitnesses who are directly from Him. You see, these Hebrew Christians, they were in danger of turning away because of persecution and distresses that were confronting them. 
It's the same thing today. We too, we are in as much danger of letting the world slip away from us as they were. If we neglect watching and praying, then we might uh, lose what we have got in the Lord. If we neglect ad attendance at the Bible study, or neglect the fellowship together at the time of revival, or we neglect the worship and the message and the, and the growth during the worship service, or if we give too much time to temporal issues and to our own business instead of the things of the Lord, we may find ourselves in the same position that the Hebrew Christians were in danger of lapsing into. There is certain danger, of course, if we reject outright so great salvation. But not only that, if we only neglect, if we only neglect the offer of salvation and holiness, we also will be in great danger. There are those who neglect to hear the word of God. How will they escape uh, if they neglect? Others, after hearing the word of God, they neglect to hate, take it. How will they escape the judgment of God? Others, they do not respond, they do not receive Christ. There are some who claim to be saved, but they neglect the warnings of scripture. The warning to watch. The warning to pray. The warning to resist temptation. The warning to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. How shall we escape if we neglect? Others carelessly neglect and forsake the assembling of ourselves together. While some neglect God's provision for Christian growth and maturity, how shall we escape backsliding and judgment if we neglect? Through neglect, our souls can be lost. Through neglect, the souls of others around us too can be lost. Through neglect, there can be serious cracks in our spiritual walls. And we may become weak and even backsliding. That's why we need to watch. Because fears, punishment, and judgment await the unsaved and the backsliding. Those who disobeyed God in the Old Testament suffered severely for their disobedience. And the God of the New Testament is not an indulgent God. Sinners who die today under the blazing light of the gospel, together with the uh, backsliders who die today under the blazing light of the gospel, will suffer greatly in hell fire. The hottest place in hell belongs to those who have rejected the most, the greatest light. The more you know, the greater the punishment for not abiding by what you know. Let's go now to point number three. Confirmation of God's word. The confirmation of God's word. Hebrews chapter 2 from the beginning of verse 3. Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Here we are told about uh, the confirmation, one, of the word of Christ, and two, of the word of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then by extension, the confirmation of the words of the preachers of, the, of today. But uh, this uh, does not need to surprise us. We need to know that this has always been the method of the Lord. When God called Moses, Moses was wondering, How will they believe me that I have seen the Lord? Then he said, What's in your hand? It's a rod, throw it down. It became a serpent, pick it back, and it became a rod again. By that sign, by that miracle, I will confirm the word that I have sent you. When God called Joshua, he was wondering, How will they believe me? How will they follow me as they have followed Moses? And God said, I will be with you as I was with Moses. How will that be done? He performed miracles. And he said, From this day, the people, I will make the people of Israel to believe you. The miracle was to be a confirmation of the word he had given them to preach. And uh, how do we know that God sent Elijah? According to my word, there shall be no rain. They, they, they found that the miracle was performed and there was no rain. And then when he prayed again and the rain came, it was a confirmation he was a servant of the Lord. 
Remember his prayer. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. Send fire from heaven that these people may know that I am thy servant you have sent me and I have done everything according to thy word. What is that saying? Give me a confirmation. I have spoken your word. Let the miracle come as a confirmation that you are the one that has given the message unto me. And you'll find that all through the Bible. In the ministry of Jesus Christ in particular, you will find that. Did you open the eyes of the blind? It was to affirm and to confirm his claim as and credential as the Messiah. Did he walk on the sea? Did he raise the dead? Did he cleanse the lepers? Did he heal all the people that were sick? Everywhere he found them, it was to confirm the word that he had preached. Uh, look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Here is where he said those miracles were meant to confirm his claim and credential as the Messiah. John chapter 10 verse 37 verse 38. If I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe me, though ye believe not me, believe the works. For that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. He was saying the miracles are the confirmation of the fact that the Lord sent me and he gave me his word and I'm preaching his word. Look at um, chapter 2 of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as he yourselves also know. Those three words are there again, signs, wonders and miracles. The confirmation of the word of Christ. But not only that, God also confirmed the bold witness of the word of the apostles. The apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ confirmed what they were saying that this thing comes from God. By the very fact that the miracles were confirmed, were confirming the message. Mark chapter 16 verse 20. Mark 16 verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. With signs following, he confirmed the word. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Through the signs of an apostle, truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, in wonders, and mighty deeds. Those signs, wonders, and mighty deeds, that is miracles, were the confirmation of the word that the Lord had given unto them. It says so. It is so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. There's something we need to note which is important here. You know, there are some people that tell us that, well, this uh, born again uh, teaching, uh, this uh, evangelical message, being born again, give your life to the Lord, receive the Lord. They say it is the message of a gospel church. It's the message of a Pentecostal church. They say it is not the message of all the other churches, but it's the message of Christ. It is not a new doctrine. It says it was first spoken by the Lord. And it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. This is telling us that the doctrine of salvation, that is the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ, is not a new doctrine. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who provided it on the cross, as he died for our sins, preached it clearly before he went to the cross. And then after his resurrection, he commanded his disciples, his apostles, to preach the same message to all the creatures in the whole world. And as they preached, that word was confirmed as it was confirmed at the time of Christ. How about today? We're still preaching that same word, and the same God is still confirming the same word 
were the same signs, wonders, and miracles. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is supremely a supernatural gospel, attended by supernatural power. God has never left his true disciples destitute of that invaluable affirmation, confirmation of the truth of his word. Till this very time, God still confirms his word with signs following. Well, we have heard the word of God today. And we have seen what the Lord is actually telling us. He's telling us, therefore, because of the exaltation of Christ, because He's greater than the angels, because He's the one that is not seated on the right hand of God after He has by Himself purged our sins, because of all that, therefore, we ought to give the more honest seed to the things which we have heard. Are you giving the, most, the more honest seed to all the word you have been hearing? Are you holding steadfastly to the word? Are you continuing in the word? Or are you letting it slip away from you? Are you allowing carelessness, prayerlessness, sleeping, dozing, sleeping even in the church, even in the church, sleeping in the church? Are you allowing that to allow the word of God to slip away from you? Lest at any time, in a time of suffering, in a time of sickness, in a time of poverty, in a time of oppression, in a time of persecution, or in a time of joy, or in a time of wealth, in a time of health, in a time of progress, in a time of prosperity, lest at any time we should let them sleep away from us. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, if Korah, Dathan, and Abiram perished, for their disobedience. If Achan perish for his transgression, how shall we escape? How shall we escape? We preachers, we leaders, we workers, we members of the church, or we sinners who have had the word of God and have refused to be born again. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing witness, and both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. You have been in this church, you know that everything we have preached, God has stood behind us. He has confirmed the word. He has said, yes, that's my word. After preaching salvation, then He heals the sick. After preaching restitution, then he heals the sick. After preaching holiness and education, then he heals the sick. After giving the word of the eminence of the imminence of the crown of the return of Christ, then he delivers the oppressed. He says, that is a confirmation that that is my word. After seeing all that we have seen, after hearing all that we have heard, after experiencing all that we have experienced, after seeing the confirmation of the word of God, we are preached from year to year in this church. If you neglect, if you disobey, if you rebel, if you transgress, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? God has given us a good heritage in this church. Don't neglect. Give the more earnest seed to all these things we are hearing from week to week, so that these things will not be stand will not be standing against you as judgment on the final day. Why don't you come to the Lord right now? If you have not been born again, stop procrastinating. Stop pushing it forward. Stop saying it will be for another time. Do it, repent, and be saved right now. You have not been sanctified, this is the time. Call upon the Lord, be sanctified today. You have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost, this is the time to seek the Lord. Call upon the Lord while He may be found. Seek ye the Lord while you can see Him right now. And let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous, let him return to the Lord. The Lord is ready to save now. This is the day of salvation. Keep to the Lord. The Lord is just about to come. Don't throw me about. Don't backslide. Don't give up what you have got. Don't allow persecution or oppression or any problem to make you go away from the Lord. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Arise and call upon the Lord. And now be steadfast with the Lord, even until you see the Lord face to face. The Lord will be with you. Give the more honesty to all the things we have heard.